Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is our last lecture of the uh, semester. Today we're dealing with the uh, law of intellectual property within the business uh, context. On Wednesday, you will have your last test uh, with respect to chapter 11 on intellectual property. And then the only thing left is going to be your uh, final exam. So at the end of today's lecture, I'll give you some more details on that together with how I'm going to be approaching the uh, finalization of all your individual grades for participation and the, uh, in, and the test that we've had for each chapter. Okay, so let's go to today's lecture. So uh, again, you should have the uh, PowerPoint for chapter 11 on your screen and I'll be up in the right hand corner. So I'll give you the lecture and then uh, we'll wind everything up. So again, we're dealing with intellectual property, IP as it's known within the uh, business context, uh, which is referred to as the digital age uh, in your, uh, in your uh, PowerPoints. And so intellectual property, again, like almost every topic we've uh, discussed over the term of the semester, uh, is again an, an incredibly important thing to be aware of if you run your own business. You have to be, uh, you have to be uh, knowledgeable with respect to the law uh, regarding intellectual property because it could impact a number of things that you do with respect to uh, your business, particularly th things that you actually create in order to make your business uh, profitable. So we're going to deal with uh, those particular types of intellectual property that are going to be discussed in a few minutes uh, and how they could impact the carrying on of your business and how the protection of those rights uh, need to be basically solidified so that if somebody infringes those rights, you have remedies to address that kind of infringement. So we're going to talk about things like copyright, uh, trademark law, patent law, industrial designs uh, and uh, and any of anything related to confidential information as it pertains to what might be very particular and important to the type of business that you you basically uh, run All right society as a whole you know, basically accepts the prospect that people who produce ideas manuscripts and inventions uh, are to be rewarded for doing that because in real terms uh, those inventions advance society, our knowledge, uh, and the ways that uh, we can be more creative in developing uh, a life around us that, uh, you know, in, is enhanced by these new inventions. And so as a function of that, the law relating to those items, copyright, trademarks, and patents, and what have you, uh, the laws who invent them for the purposes of uh, improving society as a whole. Uh, intellectual property itself is uh, a subcategory of personal property. We talked about this last day. It is a chose in action. All right. So again, it's not a specific chattel, a tangible chattel that you can pick up and carry uh, uh, from place to place. It's intangible in that the intellectual property, which is, for instance, going to be the registration of those things like copyrights and trademarks and patents, the actual instrument that is, uh, is produced as a function of that registration uh, is the chosen action that actually represents the idea behind it. So unlike a good or chattel, which is misappropriated or stolen, when something in the nature of an intellectual property right is uh, taken, then it's pretty much destroyed for the purposes of uh, the owner's use of that uh, of that intellectual property. So you know it's incredibly important, therefore, that we protect uh, these kind of things uh, where you know they cannot be recovered in real terms because they've been distributed or what have you without the owner's uh, permission. And therefore, uh, when they're when they are basically distributed by way of misappropriation, uh, they bring no value to the owner any longer. Uh, so, you know, the problem, of course, is that the value of these kind of works, copyrights, and trademarks, and patents, the value of them is considerably reduced if they've been stolen or misappropriated by somebody else. Uh, examples are, are quite simply these, the pirating 
of CDs, although I don't think CDs are produced anymore, but DVDs are. So the pirating of uh, DVDs kind of thing and their illegal distribution dramatically decreases the revenue stream for the original author. Uh, in today's uh, entertainment business, we don't even, for the most part, have DVDs uh, so much as everything is streamed. Uh, it is possible, you know, for somebody to, you know, acquire a product, uh, something that would be streamed and to which you'd have to pay a fee for. So Netflix, uh, Apple TV, Prime Video, those kind of things. Uh, the content that you have to pay a fee for can be misappropriated by others who have that technological expertise to do that uh, and, you know, can generate income, uh, you know, as a function of that misappropriation that doesn't go to the the author of the product that appears, you know, as a function of, you know, legality regarding streaming. All right, so the first thing we're going to talk about is copyright law. So copyright law, to a great degree, is uh, a law that protects ideas, ideas with the creation of things like books and magazines uh, and music uh, and videos, uh, and it could include computer programs, uh, paintings and drawings, those kind of things. So copyright law is, you know, is a, is a law that protects, you know, ideas that are incredibly creative for the most part. Uh, before somebody can allege that their uh, idea has been infringed upon or misappropriated, uh, they have to uh, basically uh, prove the following, that the, the, whatever has been misappropriated is a function of their own creative processes. So they have to be the one that, in fact, uh, created the movie or the book or the computer program or what have you, basically. Uh, and the idea is is more than the copyright is more than simply an idea. It is an actual something that society values as a creation, or or as a function of a creative process. So uh, all of these laws dealing with intellectual property are a function of federal jurisdiction. Uh, they're all contained. They're referenced in Section 91 of the Constitution Act of 1867. Uh, so and you guys are familiar with this. So uh, exclusively. Uh, federal matters uh, are in section 91 and again intellectual property is contained therein. Uh, the reason that it would be in section 91 as opposed to section 92 which deals with the provinces uh, would have to be I would think uh, a conversation that the Fathers of Confederation had in 1864 in the Charlottetown where they came together to basically uh, create the con what's going, what was going to be a new constitution for a newly created country uh, they've looked at things like patents and copyrights and, uh, and trademarks, and they saw that, in fact, they would have an application uh, certainly more, uh, you know, more uh, further afield than what a provincial boundary would, would dictate. So if you had something that you invented, uh, chances are highly likely that you would like to see it distributed across the country. Uh, more as opposed to simply being more of a local nature. So that's why it's federal as opposed to provincial. If it was of a purely uh, local nature, uh, it would in fact be provincial to, uh, to the most degree. All right, so the Copyright Act again is a federal statute and it protects the ideas that are manifested in books and articles and computer programs and movies and theater scripts and uh, songs that are written and what have you. Uh, in Canada, the creation of copyright is automatic uh, when the work is produced, which means that in, in legal terms, uh, you don't have to necessarily register the uh, copyright with the federal government who has a registry for that purpose. So the creation uh, of, the, uh, of the copyrighted materials is protected even without registration, right? So uh, that's, you know, that's a relatively unique position to take. But having said that, registration is still a good idea, right? even though it's, it goes beyond simply the right to own the copyright, but it establishes that the work created uh, is actually recorded somewhere. And again, it's gonna be the copyright register that the federal government maintains uh, and recorded for the purposes of the world to see. So if you were to write a song uh, and uh, you didn't want uh, anybody to misappropriate or infringe upon you know, the rights to produce that song, you would register the copyright for it uh, with the Copyright Office, which means that if anybody did come along later and uh, produce a song that was so similar to your song that it would 
uh, infringe your copyright, you can look to the copyright register and say, on January the 1st of 2020, I registered the copyright to this song. And what you would do obviously with the registration of the copyright is include all of the relevant considerations that went into the creation of that song. So basically not only the notes that uh, would be, which would be um, a representation of the song, uh, which you know musicians can obviously play from those notes on sheet music, but uh, you know all kinds of things with respect to how the songs are structured. And we're actually going to talk about that in a few minutes with respect to some pretty famous cases of copyright infringement relating to songs. All right, copyright itself belongs to the author or creator of the work produced, and also belongs to any employee of those of that author or creator so as you all know this is again the law of vicarious liability so uh, anything an employee does uh, that again harms uh, somebody is responsible to the employer but in this case it's anything that the uh, employee does that benefits the employer uh, is also uh, it also goes to the employer him or herself uh, the Copyright Act uh, states that a work cannot be reproduced, performed, published, copied, or otherwise used by anyone without the express approval of the copyright holder. And we all know what express means. It has to be you know, clearly stated that uh, the copyright holder uh, gives permission for, it to, for, their, for their work to be distributed. Uh, if the copyright is infringed in any way, then the copyright holder uh, can bring an action, obviously a court proceeding to seek a remedy uh, due to that infringement. Uh, copyright lasts, and this is incredibly important, for the uh, life of the creator plus 50 years. You know, that's an incredible uh, period of time to provide a copyright holder with the uh, exclusive rights with respect to any distribution and sales generated from a copyright, again, the generation of a book or a movie or a song. So it's, if you, if you come up with, if you write a song, for instance, then you, the copyright in your song lasts for uh, 50 years, uh, in addition to your, your lifetime. And that, you know, and that would necessarily go to your estate as well. All right. So uh, if you, uh, you know, basically if, I, if you create the song this year and you live for another 20 years, then you basically have the, uh, the, that right. And then for third, you know, so then for 50 years past the, uh, the, uh, after the time you passed away, the right goes to your estate. So your children, for example, uh, the remedy for an infringement can either be what's called an injunction or damages. So an injunction can be granted uh, by a court which will stop the offending party from using the work. So that's what injunctions do. They stop uh, people from uh, using other people's uh, ideas, essentially. Uh, and damages can be awarded if uh, somebody has profited from your ideas, right? So in fact, damages can be awarded. Uh, you know, if, so if somebody has taken your song or your, or your movie or your book and has improperly distributed it and earned a profit from it, then the damages are going to be certainly that profit that whoever infringed your copyright has obtained themselves contrary to the benefit of you as the copyright holder. Okay, we're gonna look at a couple of songs and we're gonna talk about uh, these songs within the confines of uh, copyright. So the first song, uh, again, this is obvious, this is embedded in about that, okay, so this, you have that song and now I want you to, um, to listen to a song by George Harrison. So at this point in my class, I usually, uh, ask for hands for those of you who know who George Harrison uh, was uh, and uh, in response to that I usually get uh, like one or two or three students who put up their hands which you know which obviously I groan when I see that because George Harrison was a Beatle the most famous musical group in the history of the planet uh, and then I again ask people who in fact know who the Beatles are and if uh, if you don't know who the Beatles are then you fail this course that's all Okay, so I, I'm not actually sure whether you actually heard these songs uh, you know, while I was running them on the PowerPoint. Uh, so if you haven't, uh, please uh, go to, you know, take the time just to take two or three minutes and listen to each song. So the first one being the Chiffons, who did He's So Fine, and the second one being George Harrison's My Sweet Lord. And uh, my question then will be for, your, for you as a class is that what comes to mind when you hear these two songs 
And what should come to mind, although it may not, because it's not, unless music is something you're really, really in tune with, uh, they're the same song. Right? And that's an incredibly uh, interesting kind of thing to have happen. And for the purposes of uh, George Harrison going forward, it ended up being a very difficult uh, situation that he then was found himself put into. So, you know, My Sweet Lord was the song by Harrison. It was uh, released uh, in November 1970, so 50 years ago. Uh, oh God, anyway, um, multi-platinum, triple a out, part of an album called All Things Must Pass. It was clearly the most successful thing that George Harrison had ever done as a solo act, as opposed to being part of the Beatles. Uh, it was his first uh, attempt at a single, basically. It topped the charts worldwide, the music charts, and was the biggest selling single of 1971 in the United Kingdom and worldwide for the most part. But here's the problem, and this, this, this came out uh, in court because the, uh, the person who wrote uh, He's So Fine sued George Harrison for copyright infringement. And here you see on this slide, these are what the court found to be the similarities uh, between the two songs. And obviously, you know, the, uh, the uh, court was given this information by people who are, you know, experts in the writing of songs, right? So after the release of uh, My Sweet Lord, basically uh, what happened was that Ronnie Mack, who wrote He's So Fine, sued, sued Harrison for copyright infringement due to obviously what uh, Mack thought was the similarity to his uh, song of He's So Fine. And uh, in 1976, a court in the UK uh, basically found that Harrison uh, was found to have, and this is really interesting, to subconsciously plagiarize the song. Uh, that's a, that, was, that had never been found before, that anybody had plagiarized something, which was obviously a copyright infringement, but had done it unintentionally. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that the uh, judge who made this decision was pretty much a Beatle fan, because this was a very kind way that he said Harrison, in fact, stole uh, the uh, the content of he's so fine, uh, and what happened obviously is that uh, you know this had reper repercussions throughout the music industry. So I can tell you in the seventies that I was a musician in the city of Toronto at the time. This was a big deal because uh, what had happened up to this uh, this point was that the uh, copying of earlier songs. Uh, hadn't been seen to any great degree as a problem. So uh, I, I could tell you that, for instance, the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, I'm not, don't put your hands up. If you, if you don't know the Rolling Stones, I can't take it. But uh, the Rolling Stones and the Beatles originally were both were, what were called cover bands. So what they did is essentially took songs already uh, written and then made them their own. Uh, and that really wasn't much of a problem. But in, in the 1970s when this happened, I mean, the Stones, uh, who were still around, uh, you know, they, they appropriated a lot of early jazz and blues songs, Muddy Waters and Robert Johnston, uh, any number of these guys who, whose songs they appropriated. And even guys like Waters and Johnston really didn't have a problem with it. They were just pleased that their songs were out in the public, even if they weren't given credit for it. But what happened, you know, after this uh, judgment in the UK in, in 1976 regarding Harrison, is that everybody started scrambling and basically rewrote their liner notes uh, for their albums, basically giving, uh, you know, giving acknowledgement to where the, the songs came from, and more often than not, made some kind of financial arrangement to basically compensate these earlier uh, versions of the songs that were reproduced to ensure that the same thing that happened to Harrison uh, didn't happen to uh, everybody else. So uh, in the case of uh, Harrison and Mac, the uh, damages uh, that were awarded was 1.6 million, which was three quarters of all the North American realty for uh, My Sweet Lord, uh, and a significant portion of the album revenue itself. Uh, in 1980, in an interview with Playboy by John Lennon, John Lennon was another Beatle, uh, basically expressed his doubts about what we've talked about, this notion of a subconscious plagiarism, and here's what Lennon had to say. Uh, he must have known, i.e. referencing Harrison, you know, he's smarter than that. He could have changed a couple of bars in that song and nobody could have ever touched him, but he just let it go and paid the price. Maybe he thought God would just sort of let him off. And at that time, uh, you know, the Beatles and Harrison particularly were you know, into uh, transcendental meditation and all kinds of things. So he was taking a shot. Uh, at to Harrison for that, and Lennon wasn't necessarily a very nice guy anyway. So uh, you know, he really 
uh, you know, didn't need to say these things in public because it certainly was hurtful to Harrison, but he did it anyway because that's who he was. The, uh, the next and the most recent uh, very famous case of uh, copyright infringement is uh, the contest between uh, Marvin Gaye uh, and uh, Robin Thicke and Pharrell Williams with respect to Blurred Lines. So I'm going to play this on the PowerPoint. Uh, and again, if you don't hear it at, uh, at home, please uh, play it yourself. And, and uh, we'll talk about uh, you know, the, the similarities in a second. Okay, I, could, I can tell you that, uh, yeah, again, you can could, you could see it on the screen, and if you didn't hear it, again, please watch it at home. But uh, Marvin Gaye's family, he's, he's now deceased, uh, sued Pharrell Williams and Robin Thicke uh, for basically uh, misappropriation of uh, his earlier song, and uh, they had to pay $7.4 in damages, which is just basically uh, inflation added to what Harrison had to pay. Uh, it, went, it was appealed, and uh, the uh, damage award was uh, reduced from 7.4 million down to about four million dollars. But again, uh, a really good example of you know how uh, songs, in particular, can be uh, infringed with respect to their copyright and uh, monies that are made by the artists. Artists who do the infringement have to pay the original uh, creators of the uh, of the original songs. All right. Uh, there are some exemptions or defenses to the infringement of copyrights. And here's what they are. We have what's called the fair dealing defense, which allows copying of a work if the purpose is for research, private study, uh, critical review, parody, or right, what have you. Uh, there are exemptions for educational institutions, uh, like obviously us, the university, museums, and archives and libraries. Uh, and exemptions for user-generated content, which again is the use by somebody who's doing it for their own purposes, but not uh, for commercial purposes. There's no, uh, none of these exemptions or defenses uh, give rise to anybody, whether it's an educational institu institution or anybody else, to actually make money from uh, the infringement of a copyright. Uh, the last thing we have with respect to uh, copyright laws is what's called moral rights. Moral rights are what authors or creators of copyrighted material maintain in a work. Uh, so the creator basically has a right to, you know, basically if, even if something has been properly sold, so if I, if I, if I make a song, if I write a song, for instance, and then I let uh, an artist uh, record that song, uh, I still retain the moral rights, even though I've been paid for the use of my copyrighted material. I retain the rights to basically go back and say, you can't use it in this fashion uh, if it takes away from what I believe to be the inherent value of my copyrighted material. So you know, basically, you, you, the, the copyright holder takes a position that anybody else, even if they're legitimately paying for the use of the copyrighted material, they cannot uh, change that material in such a way that, that I would believe it affects my reputation as the original developer of the uh, copyrighted material in the first place. Okay, so that's the law of copyright. Now we're gonna deal with the law of patent. So what patents are is, uh, is a way to, in fact, uh, register and patent requires registration, uh, your invention. 
So, you know, it's not just creative ideas like copyrights, but it's the actual invention of something, an invention that, you know, that society can use again to uh, advance its interests. Patent protection is there for 20 years, so it's not nearly as, as uh, broad as copyright, which is again the life of the creator plus 50 years. So patents are only for uh, 20 years. Uh, from the date the patent is actually registered. Now, patents are particularly uh, important to be registered because this is where you'll record all of uh, the elements that went into your patent uh, to ensure that if somebody comes up with subsequently something that looks really a lot like your invention, you can refer back to your registration, which will have all the details in it as to how the invention was created. And so that can be compared with whoever is inventing something else that you think may well be an infringement of your patent. Again, patents are governed by the federal government. So this is the, this is the uh, statute citation for the Patent Act under the revised statutes of Canada. All right, uh, patent law, you know, again, also provides for improvements that are patentable, uh, but it must involve a further invention uh, added to the original invention. Uh, so here are the, here are the examples in this, in this chart. Uh, so a, a new kind of door lock. So, you know, there's all, there's, door locks have existed for centuries, but you've basically taken that and you've added something new to it uh, to make it a, you know, a new process for opening a door, essentially. Uh, composition of matter, you know, if somebody uh, creates a composition that is used in lubricating the door lock, right, which is, you know, has never been in existence before, but it's something that is new and inventive that uh, facilitates uh, that kind of thing, right? And then you see here as well, uh, creating apparatuses uh, of building door locks and things to otherwise to make them. So these are the ways that you can in fact uh, design improvements for existing items that were certainly in, uh, patented at one point in time. Uh, I haven't failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. That's a very, very famous, uh, uh, famous uh, saying by Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison, uh, you know, had in fact, you know, thousands and thousands of patents. That's what he did. Uh, he invented the light bulb, right? So which obviously we all use uh, numerous times uh, every day of our lives for the most part. So, uh, you know, he was probably the world's most fa famous holder of patents up to today. Uh, today, in modern times, uh, Edison uh, lived and worked in the 1800s. Uh, in the last 20 years, uh, the most prolific uh, generator of patents uh, is Bill Gates. You know, Bill Gates, as you know, uh, uh, created Microsoft, uh, and uh, he himself owns six to 7,000 patents. That's my, that's my best uh, estimate when, uh, the last time I looked this up. Uh, so you know, these things obviously are incredibly valuable to Bill Gates, and that's what makes him uh, the richest man on the planet, pretty much. Uh, interesting enough, Steve Jobs, who, as you know, he's now deceased, but he created uh, Apple, uh, and uh, and uh, you know, obviously Apple uh, is a uh, you know very direct competitor to Microsoft. Uh, Steve Jobs only uh, uh, created and registered nine patents in his lifetime, so he certainly took a different approach to the protection of his uh, of his inventions uh, than did uh, Bill Gates. So there you go. Uh, so the owner of a patent has the right to produce, sell, or otherwise profit from the invention that they uh, come up with. Uh, and as with any other property, which we talked about last week, uh, patents are properties, just like copyrights are, and trademarks are, and again, we'll talk about trademarks in a few minutes, but they're property. They're intangible intellectual property. So they can be sold just like anything else that is a property. Uh, so the purpose of the uh, patent is not only to actually protect the invention that the, uh, that the inventor has come up with, but it's also to, to disclose ideas behind that invention so that advancements can be stimulated, much like creating uh, something like the door lock that can subsequently be improved upon by way of uh, advancements to, uh, to create things that make it work better going forward. So what the Patent Act requires is what's called full disclosure of all pertinent information. Uh, so this is disclosure basically in, in very 
minute detail of the things that actually went into the creation of this invention. Uh, and an incredibly famous product uh, that was invented, and this has been invented, I guess, I'm not sure, uh, 10 or 20 years ago, uh, is Viagra, right? So everybody knows what Viagra is, you know, and the function that it performs, uh, the actual function it performs, which was to address erectile dysfunction itself, uh, wasn't the actual originally intent of uh, the invention relating to this particular product. They were seeking to do something else. And the, uh, the erectile dysfunction uh, thing that it addressed was kind of like a, you know, a, uh, a sideline to what was originally intended. But of course, it became the most uh, important part of the invention. And uh, Pfizer, which is the uh, pharmaceutical company that uh, originally created Viagra, it made them the largest pharmaceutical company in the world because Viagra, in fact, has become the most widely distributed drug of its kind uh, in the world as well. But what happened with respect to uh, how Pfizer addressed uh, its patent for Viagra in Canada is that obviously, again, they had to register uh, with the patent office in Ottawa what were the particular ingredients that went into the creation of this particular uh, product. Uh, and what happened was that the patent itself was challenged uh, by another company. And I'll talk about that in a second. But the end result of that was that in 2012, the Supreme Court of Canada struck down the uh, patent on uh, Pfizer's uh, Viagra erectile dysfunction drug uh, because uh, you know, it didn't disclose what it had to do. And as a function of that, it opened up the door to generic competition. And as you all know, generic drugs uh, tend to be uh, much cheaper, for instance, than those that are branded like Viagra. So what the Supreme Court did in 2012 is that it supported an appeal by a company called Teva Pharmaceuticals. That's an Israeli-based pharmaceutical company that is the world's largest genetic drug maker. And uh, what the court said is that what Teva argued was that Pfizer had been too vague when it filed its patent. And remember, the Patent Act requires you to be very specific about uh, what you include in your patent. And so in a unanimous verdict by the court, it said that, in fact, Pfizer had not provided enough details to identify the active ingredient in Viagra. Uh, and so here's what the court said. Pfizer gained a benefit from the Patent Act which is exclusive monopoly rights while withholding disclosure in spite of its disclosure obligations under the act. Uh, Pfizer's Canadian patent, which came into force in 1998, was divided into seven parts and covered 260 quintillion, I don't even know how much that is, uh, different chemical compounds, but only one of the compounds, sildenafil, which is the active ingredient that actually provides for the erection that is the which is at the heart of the uh, of the Viagra uh, drug uh, basically had been had been hidden uh, in the disclosure provided to the patent office so you know Viagra and this and it was found that it intentionally uh, buried the importance of uh, sildenafil as the active ingredient so that others looking at the patent wouldn't know uh, what in fact made Viagra work as it did. So as a function of that, it lost its patent and, uh, and, and uh, so from 2012 forward, generic versions of Viagra became readily available in Canada. All right, the third area of intellectual property we're gonna talk about today is trademark law. So what uh, trademarks do is they protect words, symbols, and pictures associated with a business name a brand or a product. So most businesses uh, have trademarks. So these are, these are simply businesses that, you know, if you're driving along the street anywhere in Sault Ste. Marie and you look from side to side, you're going to see trademarks on both sides of the street constantly when there are businesses being carried on. And you'll see these trademarks, uh, which will be, you know, attached to the signage for the business that identifies the name of the uh, of the business and uh, the, and the kind of business that's being carried on. So trademarks are something that people are expected to identify very quickly with the business that uh, the trademark relates to. Uh, you have uh, two kinds of trademarks. You have common law trademarks and registered trademarks. Common law trademarks are those that are unregistered, right? So they basically are created just simply as a function of law, but aren't registered. Uh, but far and away, the vast, vast majority of trademarks are 
registered. And that again is very much like patent law and copyright law, where the registration of a trademark, you know, very clearly protects you uh, from other, you know, individuals or businesses uh, trying to copy your uh, trademark uh, and, uh, and not provide uh, compensation to you uh, for the business that trademark represents. Uh, so again, businesses often use logo. Logos is another word for a trademark, uh, or they're often contained in trademarks. Uh, so they identify and help the public identify their business. So in uh, real terms, in mean, this logo, this is a trademark for McDonald's. So you don't even need the word McDonald's when you see this. Everybody who sees the Golden Arches pretty much anywhere in the world, and McDonald's, I don't think, you know, I, I can't imagine there are in fact any countries in the world where you can't find uh, McDonald's, although Antarctica as a continent probably doesn't have one, but the other six continents in the, in the world probably all do, including the Arctic probably. But having said that, so uh, if somebody else uses the logo of a business, for instance, the Golden Arches or something similar to it, then what it does, it threatens the investment of the trademark holder in the business that it carries on. And uh, if somebody is going to do that, as in misappropriates or infringes a trademark, uh, the danger is, is that uh, the, uh, that uh, trademark attached to somebody who doesn't have the right to put it in front of their business may well deceive the public into thinking they are dealing with the business identified with the trademark or the logo. And that's the whole point of trademark infringement. Uh, again, trademarks are uh, federally incorporated uh, under the Trademark Act. So it's a, a section 91 provision of the constitution dealing with trademarks uh, and the act itself like copyright and patent is designed to prevent others from wrongfully using logos or identifying marks that make up somebody's trademark basically. Uh, if the trademark is infringed then the person who holds that trademark has to show two things that in fact it owns the trademark and here's and this is why it's exceptionally important to register your trademark because that's absolute proof that you own it, right? It's gonna be in the trademark registry that's maintained by the government of Canada uh, and uh, it's there for the world to see. And then the second thing, of course, is, is that if you think that your trademark is being infringed, you have to prove that the public actually would be confused with your trademark appearing on some premises that is not related to your business. So here's the examples. So. If the uh, Golden Arches were in front of a car, car dealership, would that infringe the trademark? So I would ask you, this is the class, and in uh, past classes where I've done this, about half of you put up your hands thinking that it would be an infringement, and the other half don't. So half of you think that if uh, Maitland Ford on the Great Northern had Golden Arches on the exterior of its wall, uh, half of you think that that uh, wouldn't be a trademark infringement in that you would just assume that uh, you can't go inside there and get a Big Mac, for instance. But the other half of you actually believes that, in fact, if, if Maitland Ford had those golden arches on the wall, it must have a McDonald's inside uh, and therefore somewhere where you can go and, and order off the McDonald's menu. So, you know, it, it's divided on who would be uh, confused by the Golden Arches being on a car dealership. And it's again, it's about 50-50. Having said that, would you still be confused if the uh, Golden Arches, or at least the shape of those arches, uh, were on uh, some business, but instead of being golden or yellow, they're in fact blue. So if you saw blue arches on a business, would you associate that with McDonald's? And keeping in mind, of course, then that when McDonald's registers its trademark in countries around the world, it's not only the color, but it's the shape that is, uh, is indicative of the trademark being protected, those arches itself. So again, if blue arches are on uh, a business like a car dealership, uh, you know, and in exact the same shape as the arches that have been trademarked by McDonald's, would you be confused in that thinking that, uh, that you, could, you could obtain uh, you know, menu items for McDonald's inside that particular building. And when I ask a class this particular question, uh, almost everybody agrees that in fact, uh, they wouldn't be confused. They wouldn't actually think that you could get 
you know, a Big Mac or a Whopper, or whatever it's not a Whopper, but a Big Mac or a quarter pounder or whatever it's going to be inside the building if the arches were blue, which tells you that, uh, you know, the, the change in color uh, also, for the most part, eliminates uh, any prospective confusion uh, with, the, with the use of a trademark. Okay. Uh, lastly, we're going to deal with industrial design laws. So industrial designs are basically where a government grants an exclusive license to uh, a business that carries on an industry that mass produces uh, articles for the public. All right, so it's, it's very much part of copyright law, but we're not here dealing with the protection of a single idea, a song or a book or a movie, we're dealing with something that is mass produced. So in fact, this is the, this is the statute, again, it's a federal statute that protects the mass production of ideas. Uh, like patents, industrial designs must be registered. Uh, and in this case, the uh, protection for the, uh, for the design is 10 years. So it's half of what a patent provides. And it's just a fraction of what copyright law provides. Uh, and it must apply to a finished product, right? So it must not only design, describe the design in the registration, but also how the, the industrial design has changed that original product. Uh, and again, the remedies, if this happens, if somebody basically infringes an industrial design, that uh, an injunction can be ordered to stop the reproduction of that industrial design by whichever industry is mass producing it. And of course, damages can be uh, awarded if profits have been made improperly. Uh, we also have trade secrets and confidential uh, information. So uh, trade secrets are things that businesses have that are totally internal to the business as to how it operates. So you know, to a great degree, it's again, our, these are creative processes that have come up with something uh, that adds a great deal of value to the business, but it needs to be kept secret because the business does not want uh, the, this kind of information out into the public sphere where another business who could be a competitor can have, take advantage of these trade secrets. Uh, likewise, we have what's called confidential business information. Uh, this is information that uh, for the most part, uh, employees or key uh, directors of businesses uh, are obliged to keep quiet Right, with respect to the carrying on of the business. Right? These, this is information that, again, gives a business an advantage in the marketplace. So, you know, in a business, you know, it's really, really important for them, for instance, to have the exclusive uh, control of their customer lists so that, you know, a competitor, you know, can't take those lists and then, you know, go to those customers directly. So that has to be protected. A business's business plan, how it uh, intends to uh, operate, how it intends to grow over uh, time, the kind of income it expects to generate uh, as compared to the expenses it'll take to generate that income. All those kind of things are in a business plan and all those things should be confidential to uh, a business uh, and how it expects to make a profit. Uh, if the, a breach of co confidence in any of those things is basically a disclosure of information of um, trade secrets or confidential business information. So, you know, it's a breach of confidence if you are an employee or a key director uh, or, or management personnel that in fact uh, gives this information out, not just to the public, but more particularly to competitors for whatever business has these uh, secrets and confidences. Um, this kind of uh, intellectual property can be protected, right? Uh, as long as, again, the, the secrets, the information are not known in the industry, uh, the information presents a business advantage. Obviously, that's the purpose of having this kind of information and keeping it uh, in-house, so to speak. Uh, and efforts have been made to, in fact, ensure that information like this does, in fact, stay uh, in the business and is not uh, leaked out to uh, competitors. If, in fact, that information is leaked out to competitors, then the person or the business that holds these trade secrets uh, can do a number of things, but here's what they have to show in order to substanti substantiate a breach of confidence. They have to show that the information was confidential, uh, that the information was communicated to the recipient in confidence so that the, the employee or the uh, directors or management uh, was given this information by the business 
uh, incompetence in that they are expressly told that they aren't to take it outside the business. And then, of course, somebody uh, who has been given that confidential information or trade secret has, in fact, uh, given it out. Right. So, you know, that will that will result in a lawsuit to protect the uh, those uh, uh, those trade secrets. And, and again, uh, that will result in damages that would be recoverable for the lost profits that the that the release of those trade secrets and confident information has given rise to. Right. We also have privacy protections that are in place for uh, businesses. So businesses have a legal obligation with respect to the collection, the use, the disclosure and safeguarding of personal information they collect. This is personal information they collect uh, fundamentally from their employees. So businesses have a, uh, a legal requirement to protect that. So PEPIDA, that is the uh, statute, the Personal Information Protection and Electronic Documents Act that is put in place that requires businesses uh, to obtain the consent of individuals uh, in collecting their personal information uh, and that that information can only be used for pre-identified purposes. So if a business asks you for personal information as a function of you becoming an employee, they have to basically get your consent to provide that information and they also have to tell you what the purpose of them collecting this information uh, is designed for and the employee again, in addition to giving the consent, has to agree that they understand what the purpose uh, for the release of information uh, to the employer is uh, for. Uh, and uh, obviously it's a breach of this act and privacy if that personal information is in any terms or any way released in a manner that uh, is not authorized uh, as a function of the employee giving their consent, right? Uh, and lastly, on intellectual property, we have uh, the issue of uh, electronic communications. We've spent a whole class on this, but this is particularly dealing with uh, spam. Right, so everybody knows what spam is, and we have, in fact, legislation, it's called Canada's anti-spam legislation, that addresses the unwanted commercial electronic messages being sent by email, text, or social networking uh, to, uh, you know, to people, essentially, or re recipients at the end of the electronic transmission uh, who really shouldn't be giving this be obtaining this information with respect to individuals. Uh, and if businesses uh, basically breach uh, the uh, CASL, then they're liable to a $10 million fine. So in order to comply with the CASL, businesses have to do this, that all messages must be permission-based. They send out all messages must contain an easy to find uh, unsubscribable link, which means it's openly accessible. Uh, the subject line of the message must pertain to the uh, content of the message and the message was identify the sender's name, business, and contact information. So if all that is complied with, then uh, legislation uh, isn't a problem, but if it isn't complied with, then of course there's a, there's a, there's a breach of privacy uh, and uh, which becomes a real issue. Okay, so all right guys, that's it. That's the lecture for today on intellectual property. And that's the last lecture on the 11 chapters that we've had uh, in our textbook. So uh, thank you very much for hanging in there. Uh, and, and particularly, obviously, with uh, adapting to this uh, mode of delivery that uh, certainly wasn't what we expected at the beginning of the semester. So I'm just going to give you uh, just a quick uh, oversight of what's going to happen now going forward with respect to uh, your, your grades. So uh, your in participation, including uh, today and participation for the test on Wednesday, uh, that will have given us, in including the uh, small assignment for a civil action, uh, we have 25 items on CMS dealing with participation. So I will only count your best 18 scores. So I will be going, this is, I'll be doing this this week, I'll be going through uh, your uh, CMS grades individually and uh, removing uh, you know, basically everything that doesn't, it should be part of your best 18 scores. Uh, chapter tests, we've had 10 chapter tests. We didn't have a test individually for chapter five because that was rolled into uh, your midterm exam. So we've actually had 10 tests. And uh, just as with participation, I will go back and I will only record for the purposes of your final grade, uh, your best seven test scores. Right? And that's something that I, that I told you I was going to do at the beginning of the semester. And now I'm just putting that in place now that the semester is coming to an end. 
Okay, so let's talk about your final exam. So your final exam is going to take place on April the 7th, which is next, a week from tomorrow, next Tuesday evening. Uh, it's going to start at 7 o'clock. It will be, as always, a Google form, exactly the same format as your uh, tests and your midterm exams. So it will be comprised of 100 questions, being a combination of true and false and multiple choice. You will have uh, three hours uh, to complete it. And that's a very strict time frame. I can't imagine you're going to need all three hours, but uh, if those of you who do, it will be cut off right at the three hour mark. So, uh, you know, please make sure that you, you know, watch your clocks or your watches uh, to ensure that you, uh, you comply with that time frame. Right? And having, a, and then uh, obviously I will then have, for the purposes of your final grade, I will have your best participation marks, your best in class uh, test marks. I have your score from your midterm exam and I will have your score from your final exam. So that will make up your uh, final grade. I will post the, uh, you know, the uh, scores for your final exam either late Tuesday evening or next Wednesday, which would be April the 8th. All right, uh, so that's it. So again, thank you very much everybody for taking the course. I very much uh, have enjoyed teaching you. It's been a good class. Uh, and so we'll call it, uh, that's it for today. And uh, again, good luck on your uh, test on Wednesday. Good luck on your final exam. Uh, and uh, it's been a pleasure teaching you. So thank you very much. Bye.